everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of continuous functions and introduce a few other little theorems that also help us establish the discontinuity of functions and a couple special functions known as the Tome and Dirichlet functions um, that sort of challenge the intuition of what a lot of people uh, interpret as a function being continuous. So what I want to do is uh, first off uh, give a couple theorems um, that are associated to sequences that we're going to actually be using um, for the proofs of some of these important theorems for continuity of functions, but they also serve uh, as important tools as well aside from the continuity of functions. And the first theorem states the following. Let us assume that A is any real number then there always exists a sequence of rational numbers that converge to that real number. So regardless of how crazy this real number might be, whether it be the square root of 2, pi, e, um, e to the power of pi divided by the square root of 2, regardless of how complex, we can always construct a sequence of rational numbers, you know, just a bunch of fractions of integers, um, that converge um, to this complicated, uh, potentially irrational, potentially rational, but generally speaking, real number. So how can we prove that such a sequence always exists? Okay, so first off, let's assume that A is an arbitrary real number any real number at all. Obviously the real numbers are closed under addition, so alpha plus one will also be a real number as well. So what do we know about the rational numbers with respect to the set of reals? So we know that Q is a dense subset of the real numbers. That means what? So between any two real numbers that are distinct, there always exists a rational number between them, right? So since Q is dense in R, that means that there exists some number, let's call it Q1, um, between alpha and alpha plus one. And here Q1 is a rational number and alpha and alpha plus one are reals. Okay, again, since Q is, again, a dense subset of the set of reals, that means what? That means there exists some number Q2 in the interval alpha and alpha plus 1 over 2. Again, Q2 in the set of rationals. And we're going to continue this sequence. So practically what we're doing is we're building a sequence of rational numbers q1, q2, q3, q4, and so on. So inductively, what we're going to have is, again, since q is a dense subset of r, that means there exists some number qm in the interval alpha, alpha plus 1 over n. Again, qn in the rationals and n being a natural number. Right. So what do we exactly have here? So I'm obviously building a sequence uh, and each of these rational numbers belongs to an open interval, alpha and alpha plus something, in particular a rational number. So the left boundaries, notice, are all alpha and the right boundary is alpha plus 1, alpha plus 1 over 2, alpha plus 1 over n, and so on. Um, and we know that that right boundary, that 1 over n term, does converge to 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define two sequences. The first sequence is going to be equal to the left boundary sequences. So alpha, 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 and so on. And the other sequence is going to be the right boundaries of these intervals that these Qs belong to, in particular alpha plus 1 over n, where n belongs to the set of natural numbers. So if these are our boundary sequences for our sequence of rationals, what can we say about the limit? So if a n is a constant sequence that we already know that the limit of that constant sequence is the constant in that sequence, and we know by properties of limits, the limit of alpha plus 1 over n is just the alpha plus 0 which is of course gonna be equal to alpha. So even though these sequences are quite different, their limits, as n goes to infinity, are indeed the same. So by construction, what we have here is that a n is less than or equal to q n is less than or equal to b n, and that's obviously true 
for all n in the set of natural numbers. And then by the sandwich theorem or the squeeze theorem for limits, we also have that the limit of a n will be less than or equal to the limit of q n is less than or equal to the limit of b n. Keep in mind that this q n belongs to the set of rationals and we have a bunch of real numbers on the left and on the right. In particular, the limit of the left hand side is equal to alpha. The limit of the interior we do not know. And the limit of the right hand side is equal to alpha. So by the sandwich theorem, we have that the limit of qn must also be alpha as well. Right? So therefore, regardless of this real number alpha, we can always construct a sequence of rational numbers qn such that the limit of qn is equal to that real number alpha for which you're trying to represent as a sequence of rational numbers. The first two theorems I have here are actually quite easy to prove, the first being very, very common in any elementary proof class, and that's that the square root of 2 is not a rational number, implying it's an irrational number, um, which you can usually do by just assuming that it is irrational, uh, represented by a quotient of uh, integers that are relatively prime, and then trying to seek a contradiction somewhere in that logic. Also, with a quick proof of contradiction, if the square root of 2 is an irrational number and q is a rational number, um, you should be able to prove that q plus the square root of 2 is also an irrational number, and the proof of contradiction is sort of based on closure of rational numbers under addition and multiplication. Now an important consequence from these two ideas is that the irrational numbers are also dense in the set of, ration, in the set of reals, just like the rational numbers are. So let's see if we can go ahead and prove that just like the rationals, the irrationals are dense in R. So how do we prove that the set is dense in R? So we need to pick any two numbers in R. So let's assume that X and Y uh, belong to the set of real numbers. Uh, and let's assume that uh, X is less than Y um, without loss of generality, right? So since Q is dense in R, so since Q is dense in R, that means what? That means that there exists a Q1 in the set of rationals such that X is less than Q1 is less than Y, right? And we've already proved that before and that's practically why the set of rationals are dense in R, but notice that we're trying to target the irrationals now, okay? So keep in mind that Q1 is a rational number, X and Y are any arbitrary reals, right? So that's very important. Also, we know that there exists a Q in the set of rationals such that X minus two, the square root, is less than Q, is less than Y minus the square root of two. And why is this the case? Well, keep in mind, X is a real number, square root of two is a real number, therefore this is a real number as well. Y is a real number, square root of two is a real number, and therefore its difference is also an element of the reals. So since x minus square root of 2 and y minus square root of 2 are not uh, equal real numbers, and that's quite easy to prove because we're assuming that x is less than y, so we can subtract square root of 2 from both sides from that inequality, that means there exists a rational number b between them. Right? So that's practically what we mean by q is dense in r. So what I want to do is I actually want to add the square root of 2 to both sides. And now we have that x is less than q plus the square root of 2, and that must be less than y. So keep in mind, x and y are arbitrary real numbers. And by that little baby theorem, we already know that q plus the square root of 2, is, if q is rational, belongs to the set of irrational numbers, r backslash q. Right, so between any two reals, arbitrary, we can always find an irrational number between them. Therefore, we have that the set of irrational numbers is a dense subset of R. Right, and that's actually quite useful. Now, another very useful uh, theorem, because you know we can always construct uh, sequences of rational numbers that converge to a real number. A very parallel theorem to that, that sort of completes that story, is the following. Let's assume that alpha is an arbitrary real number. Then there exists a sequence 
that belongs to the irrational numbers, again, where n belongs to the set of naturals, such that the limit of this irrational sequence is equal to the real number that you choose. And the proof of that practically follows the same exact strategy as before, just like we proved that there always exists a rational sequence that converges to a real. Keep in mind that proof was premised on the base of Q being dense in R. Now we've shown that R slash Q is dense in R, and therefore the proof of this practically follows parallel to that proof that we provided earlier. The next theorem is an equivalent perspective of what we mean by F being discontinuous at a point. Keep in mind that before we define the function as discontinuous, if the limit of the function wasn't equal to the actual definition of the function at that point. But there are other ways to prove discontinuity um, via sequences, and we encountered this when we were exploring how to show that the limit of a function does not exist at a point. So we say that a function is discontinuous at the point A, and obviously A is inside of the domain of this mapping F, if, again, this sequence is entirely contained in the domain, the limit of that sequence is equal to the domain value of interest, but the limit of the function evaluated at the sequence is not equal to the function evaluated at the domain value. So let's sort of view this from the perspective of the definition of epsilon and delta. So what do we mean by the limit of a n is equal to a? So this is sort of focusing on the fact that zero is less than x minus a is less than delta, and obviously we can drop zero less than, provided that a is a limit point, or x is allowed to take the value of the limit point a inside of set a, right? So this says as x gets arbitrarily close to a, which obviously a n converges to a says practically the same exact thing, then the function value f of x minus f of a, keep in mind f of a is the limit of a n, which is a, um, this should be less than epsilon. But if it's not equal to f of a, that means this must be greater than or equal to epsilon for at least some epsilon greater than zero. So as x gets arbitrarily close to this point, practically this distance gets arbitrarily large, right? So that's practically what we're sort of going for here. So the proof of that practically follows straight from the definition, so I'm not going to get into it. And instead I'm going to introduce our first special function, which is called Tomei's Tomei's function. And it goes like this. So we're going to be denoting the Tomei function by th. And it's going to start off being defined on the positive reals. So just 0, infinity, 2r. But you can extend this to r by just sort of dropping um, 0 to infinity and just replacing it r. Um, but the proof of the 0 to infinity case is a little bit more easier than the general case. So I'm just going to treat that as the positive reals only. And the Tomei function is defined as follows. So Tomei of x will be equal to zero if x is a irrational number, in this case a positive irrational number, and it's gonna be equal to one over b if x is equal to a over b where a and b are integers with b non-zero. And let's also assume that the greatest common divisor of a and b is equal to one, i.e. they are relatively prime and hence that fraction cannot be reduced. So this is the Tomei function, and it's going to be defined the same exact way if we replace 0 to infinity with r. So what's so special about this function? So the theorem that I want to provide says exactly what's so special about this Tomei function, and it says the following. The function Tomei is discontinuous is discontinuous on the rationals. Moreover, it's discontinuous on the rationals, intersection with zero to infinity, um, at least for this partial definition of the Tommy function. But if you extend it to the set of reals, it's also going to be discontinuous on all rationals, positive and also negative and zero. Great. So how are we going to prove that the Tomei function is discontinuous at every single 
rational number, and that might lead you to believe that, okay, if it's discontinuous at every rational and the rationals are dense in R, then it probably is discontinuous on all of R, right? We'll revisit that problem in just a moment. So let's just focus on um, the fact that it's discontinuous on the rationals. So how we show it's discontinuous on a set? Well, we obviously need to choose an arbitrary element in that set and show it's true for all. So let's assume that A belongs to the interval Q intersection zero to infinity and the proof for the negative version is practically the same as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a n to be an element in the set of irrational numbers. So it's a sequence of irrational numbers. So it's a sequence of irrational numbers, right? And obviously n is a element of the set of natural numbers else. It won't be a sequence. And let's assume this sequence is one that converges to a. And keep in mind a is a rational. So how can we define this sequence of irrational such that the limit is equal to a rational? Well, we've already proven that such a sequence exist, right, by that theorem that we proved a little bit earlier. There always exists a sequence of irrationals that converge to um, any real, in particular a rational number. Okay, so what do we need to show in order to justify that the Tomei function is discontinuous on Q? So what we need, and I'm just going to sort of uh, notate this, so we need that the limits of f of a n we need this to be equal to a, or alpha, for possible continuity. Right? So let's actually call that alpha as well. For possible continuity. Right? So if a n converges to alpha, then f of a n must converge to that value, actually it should be f of alpha, uh, in order for this function to be possible, right? So if we want to show that it's discontinuous, then we need to show that f of a n does not converge to f of alpha for discontinuity, right? So that's our goal. So let's see what we have here. So we have a sequence of irrationals that converge to a rational. So what do we have? So the Tomei function evaluated at a, so keep in mind, and let's assume that's alpha again. Alpha is equal to what? Well, alpha is irrational, so that means it's equal to the denominator or the reciprocal of the denominator, um, since it's a rational, since it is a rational number, and that's obviously true for some natural number b, right? So for some natural number b. Okay, so that's what it is. So life is good so far. And now let's take the limit of the sequence. So what is the limit of the Tomei function of that sequence of rational numbers? So that's obviously going to be equal to this limit of, so what is this sequence a n? Well, a n is a sequence of irrational numbers, and the Tomei function of irrational numbers is just going to be a bunch of zeros. So it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0. And we know that the limit of that function is equal to 0. But what is this? So is the limit of our sequence equal to the function evaluated at our limit point? Well, the function evaluated at our limit point is equal to 1 minus b, which is positive, and that's obviously not equal to the number 0, because a positive number and a 0 number cannot be true, truly equal due to the trichotomy property of the reals, right? So that's not equal to Tomei of alpha, right? So since the limit of the function evaluated at the sequence is not equal to the function evaluated at the limit, then we have that Tomei is discontinuous on the set of rationals. And obviously this can be true for uh, any rational, not just the positive ones. So we've already shown that the Tomei function is discontinuous on the set of rational numbers. So, and again, the set of rational numbers is dense in R, so intuition leads us to believe um, that it probably is discontinuous on all of R, 
right? So is that really the case? So what about the set of irrational numbers? So we're discontinuous on the rationals. What about on the irrationals? So the next theorem states that the Tommy function is actually not discontinuous, but it is actually continuous on the set of irrationals. So discontinuous on the rationals, continuous on the irrationals, right? So intuition definitely is not happy um, with that particular result. So let's see if we can provide a relatively formal uh, justification of this very interesting property, right? So let's see if we can actually prove this with the limit delta uh, delta epsilon definition, since that's typically how we show that it's continuous on a set, right? So how do we show it's continuous on a set? Well, obviously we need to pick an arbitrary element in that set. So we're going to pick an arbitrary element in the set of irrationals, in particular the positive irrationals, but the proof is practically the same for the negative irrationals, and zero is not irrational, so zero doesn't need to be included in the generalized proof. So let A be, actually let's, yeah, let's call it alpha, just like we did before. Let alpha be an arbitrary irrational number that's positive. And let's also assume that epsilon is a positive real number, right? Now, we're going to take advantage of the fact that epsilon is a real number here. So since epsilon is a positive real number, then there exists an n in the natural numbers such that 0 is less than 1 over n is less than epsilon. So this is practically just a variation of the Archimedean principle. Okay, so we're going to use this in just a moment, but I'm just going to set it aside because, you know, we just uh, mentioned alpha, and here's just a very useful property about alpha. And we're also going to consider the interval i, and I'm actually going to call it, uh, I'm going to call it i1, um, which is going to be equal to alpha minus 1 and alpha plus 1. And again, alpha is a irrational number. So it's irrational number minus one, irrational number plus one. So like pi minus one, pi plus one, that type of thing. And we're also going to consider an arbitrary rational number that's positive. In particular, let's assume that x is equal to a over b in the set of rationals. And let's assume that this belongs to the interval zero to infinity, right? So what can you tell me about the denominators b, right? So keep in mind this thing is entirely positive and let's assume that the greatest common denominator is always equal to one uh, with a and b both being positive numbers so if b and a are positive numbers in particular natural numbers um, then the minimum value of b is going to be equal to one right so if we write this in words that means the denominators denominators, denominators of x are bounded below. So that's a set that's bounded below. So let's actually specify this set. So let d be equal to the set of denominators of x, which are going to be equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to, and let's assume n minus 1. Right? So this is the set of all denominators less than n. The set of all denominators less than n. Right, And this n is going to be the same exact n in the set of natural numbers here. Okay, So what's so special about this? Well, this is a set of all denominators less than n for some arbitrary rational number x. So it's obviously the case that d is a finite set. Right? It's a set of it's a subset of the natural numbers that's bounded above, therefore that guarantees that it is a finite set. So let's actually look at this arbitrary interval I1 with respect to these denominators in D. Right? So let's draw a little graph to sort of see what we're looking at here. So here's our alpha minus one, here's our alpha plus one, here's our alpha in between, and let's assume that this interval contains the finite number. Let's assume that this contains the rational numbers, the rational numbers 
whose denominators denominators belong to D. All right, so it's the set of rational numbers. Let's assume the rational numbers are in the form, again, A over B with B less than M. All right, so obviously this set is bounded above and bounded below. That's pretty trivial. And it's a bunch of rational numbers, obviously countable number of them. So what can we do? So what we're going to do is we're going to choose our delta such that, because keep in mind this set is a finite set, so we can always build an interval around alpha that's arbitrarily small that doesn't contain any of them, right? So we're going to choose our delta, the greater than zero, such that the interval, and I'm gonna call this interval i delta now because this bigger interval was i1, so practically I'm looking at a neighborhood around alpha. So i delta is gonna be equal to, if we want to write this formally as a neighborhood, that would be i delta alpha. So it's gonna be alpha minus delta, and then alpha plus delta, alpha plus delta, such that this interval, well, we already wrote such that, such that this interval contains no elements of the rational numbers equals to a over b where b is less than m. Right? So delta is going to be the distance that makes this interval around alpha, and again alpha is a irrational number, such that this neighborhood around this irrational number does not contain any rational numbers whose denominator is less than n, where this n is defined as the reciprocal less than the epsilon I chose in the beginning. So definitely a little bit more of a complex sequence there. So why do we care? So therefore, if the distance between x minus alpha is less than delta, and obviously x is an arbitrary number between zero and infinity, and what do we get? And keep in mind, alpha is an irrational number. Let's again, not forget that. So as X gets arbitrarily close to an irrational number, what can we say about the distance between the Tomei function and Tomei of alpha, right? If this is less than epsilon, then we have shown that the set of irrational numbers uh, is a set for which this Tomei function is continuous on. So the distance between Tomei function x and Tomei alpha is equal to what? So keep in mind alpha is an irrational number, so therefore Tomei of alpha is going to be equal to zero. So we have Tomei of x minus zero, which we know is just equal to the Tomei of x. Right? So what do we know about the Tomei of x value? Well, we know that that's always less than or equal to one over m. And why is that the case? So keep in mind that that is from the fact that Tomei is defined to be equal to zero, and it's also defined to be equal to one over B. And what do we know about B and N? Well, if you remember, the relationship between these two things is that zero is less than one over N is less than or equal to epsilon. So how does that connect exactly with B? Well, the interval I delta alpha is the interval that contains no elements of x in the set of rationals, where b is less than n. So if you want to be a little bit more clear about this, because we know that specifically, Tommy of x is equal to zero in one over b, so you can say that this is always less than or equal to one over b, because technically one over b is an upper bound for the Tommy function. And we know that if this is the case, if b is less than n, uh, that means one over b is greater than one over n. Right? So if that's the case, then we have that one over n is less than one over b. So technically speaking, we can say that this is arbitrarily small and hence less than one over m. Right? So once we have that, then what do we have? So here we can choose our n to be uh, equal to like the reciprocal of epsilon. But keep in mind, what is one over n? Well, one over n is actually strictly less than epsilon by the Archimedean principle that we stated before. So we actually don't have to choose our n. This always exists by the Archimedean principle. 
So we've shown that the Tomei x minus Tomei of alpha is arbitrarily small. Therefore, Tomei is continuous, is continuous on the irrationals. And we've already shown that Tomei is discontinuous on the rationals. Obviously this proof was only for the positive side, but you can practically mirror the proof for the negative side and then unionize those proofs to get the entire set of rationals and irrationals. And that completes the proof of this very strange Tomei function. The next function I want to introduce is sometimes referred to as the Dirichlet function. And there are a couple variations out there of the Dirichlet function, but this is one of them. Um, some people will actually define this function, you know, where it's equal to zero on some set and one um, elsewhere. Sometimes people will notate this as an indicator function. Usually they will use the fancy number one symbol um, subscripted with the set for which it is one on. Um, and then treat that as a function x. So sometimes people will call this the indicator function on the set of rationals, right? But it's also called the Dirichlet function as well. So what's so special about the Dirichlet function? So notice that the Dirichlet function is defined the same way as the Tomé function on the set of irrationals. We're defining that to be equal to zero, and we're defining it to be a constant value on the set of rationals now. So keep in mind what was so special about the Tomei function in terms of continuity. Well, it was discontinuous on the set of rationals and continuous on the set of irrationals. So what can be said about the Dirichlet function? So the next theorem states precisely that, and you might want to take a moment and guess what you think it is. So the function, so the function Dirichlet function, which I'm going to denote by di, is blank. Guess. Do you think it's continuous everywhere? Discontinuous everywhere? Continuous only on the rationals, the irrationals, and so on. So it is not continuous, or we could say it's discontinuous. It's discontinuous everywhere, nowhere. Technically, it's discontinuous everywhere. Right? So it's not even continuous on the set of irrationals like the Tomei function was. It's con discontinuous everywhere, but it's practically just a bunch of constant functions. So if we were to graph what this function looks like on a coordinate plane using some software, what you would probably get is a bunch of two horizontal lines, one at zero, one at one. I mean, at least how I drew it, it looks continuous. I didn't pick up my pen or anything. But technically, there's these little holes that are arbitrarily close to one another due to denseness of irrationals and rationals um, in the set of real numbers. So it looks continuous, but actually it's not continuous anywhere. Right? So that's kind of unfortunate and sad for Dirichlet function, but nonetheless, let's see if we can justify it. So since we're going for discontinuity here, obviously we're going to be going about it in the sequence approach. Um, so let's see if we remember how to prove a function is discontinuous using sequences. And keep in mind, we're trying to show that it's discontinuous everywhere. So either it's in the set of rationals or it's in the set of irrationals. So I'm going to break this into a two-case proof. Case one, set of rationals, and case two, the set of irrationals. So proof for the set of rationals. So I'm going to choose an arbitrary point in the set of rational numbers, and I'm going to define a sequence. I'm going to define a n to be a sequence in the set of irrational numbers, again, n in the set of natural numbers, such that the limit of a n is equal to alpha, right? And this alpha is going to be, again, this number in the set of rational numbers. So let's just make that the case. Uh, it's obviously in the set of rationals. And how do we know that the sequence exists? So it's just a sequence of irrational numbers that converge to a particular real. In particular, I want it to converge to this rational number, alpha, right? So let's prove that this sequence diverges or this function diverges on the rationals. So what do we see? So the limit of f of a m, so what is that? So that's the limit of the Dirichlet function evaluated at this sequence. So keep in mind, how is this sequence defined? So this is a sequence of irrational numbers, and for irrational numbers, we're defined to be equal to zero.
So that means this is going to be the limits of the sequence, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And we already know that that's going to be equal to 0. But the Dirichlet function evaluated at the limit of the sequence. So the Dirichlet function evaluated at alpha, keep in mind alpha is a rational, is going to be defined to be equal to 1. Right? So keep in mind, in terms of how to prove this, it's practically a three-step proof. So first you have to show, so let's actually reorganize this. So the first thing that you should need to show is that the limits of a n is equal to alpha, the point that you're trying to show it's discontinuous at. So these two things have to match. So if you're trying to show that this function is discontinuous at alpha in the rationals, you need to show the limit of the sequence is equal to that point. And you need to show that the function evaluated at that limit point and the limit of the function evaluated at that sequence are not equal to the same exact thing. Right? So step one, and then step 2.1, and then step 2.2. Right? So first show the limit of the sequence is alpha, the point in the domain, and then show that the limit of the function of the sequence does not equal to the function evaluated at the limit of the sequence. Right? So zero does not equal to one, therefore the Dirichlet function uh, does not belong to the set of continuous functions on the set of rationals. Okay, so let's see if we can do the proof for irrationals. So let A be an element of the set of irrational numbers. And if you, want to, if you want to try this proof on your own, feel free to pause the video and do it on your own. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a sequence Bn in the set of rational numbers, such that n obviously is in the set of naturals, such that the limits of Bn is equal to alpha. Actually, let's, to avoid confusion, let's actually call this beta. So let's call this limit beta. B and beta, I guess they go together. All right, so that's the first thing that we need to show. So we need to show that this function is discontinuous at beta. So we just need to build a sequence that converges to that point in its domain of the function, right? So that's step one. Now let's do step 2.1 and 2.2. So what do we have? So what is the limit of the function evaluated at the sequence? So keep in mind, what is Bn? Bn is a rational number, so all elements of Bn evaluate to one under the Dirichlet function. So keep in mind, this is just gonna be the limit of the Dirichlet function evaluated at a bunch of rational numbers. So that's just the limit of the sequence, limit of the sequence one, 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 and one and one and one. We already know that's equal to one. And we need to look at the function evaluated at our point beta, right? So what is f of beta? Well, beta is a irrational number and f of beta evaluates to zero, right? So di of beta is equal to zero. So this checks out, n zero one do not equal to each other, therefore we have what? So therefore the Dirichlet function does not belong to the set of continuous functions on the set of irrational numbers. And combining these two results, we have that di is discontinuous. Where? Discontinuous everywhere, right? Even though it is defined everywhere, it's not continuous anywhere. And that completes the proof for the discontinuity of Dirichlet. The last theorem that I want to close out with today, sometimes referred to as the Bloomberg theorem, and it says the following. Let's assume that we have an, a function f that maps a to r. Then there always exists a dense subset of its domain, and let's call that dense subset s, such that f is continuous on s, even if f isn't continuous on a. So practically, what does that mean? So even if the function is not continuous on its domain, there always exists a dense subset of its domain, such that the restriction of the function on that subset will definitely be continuous on that subset. So let's look at a couple examples, in particular the Tomei and Dirichlet function. 
So if we recall the function Tome, which let's assume now that it maps R to R, what do we know about this? So this is not continuous. It's not continuous on R because it's not continuous on the rational numbers. But if we take the function Tome and restrict it on the set of irrational numbers, and obviously map it to R, this function is continuous, right? So some people will just say a function is continuous if it's continuous at all points in its domain, right? And why do we know that this set exists? Well, R slash Q is a dense subset of R. So even if the function is not continuous on its domain, there always exists a subset of it that's dense in the set such that it is continuous on that dense subset. Now, keep in mind here, if we define Tome on the set of irrationals, that practically Tome, a function of x, is practically, at least in the dense sense, um, just equal to the function zero. So if you look at the graph of the Tome function on the restriction of the rationals, practically what you have here is just a bunch of points sort of stacked next to each other in a dense fashion that practically, at least intuit intuitively, looks like a horizontal line. But keep in mind, there are infinitely, countably, infinitely many gaps in this particular domain, um, in particular the rationals, um, that this line does not have within it. Right? So for any function, even if it's not continuous on a domain, there always exists a dense subset of that domain such that the function restricted on that domain is continuous. So let's see if we can think about it from the Dirichlet perspective. So the Dirichlet function, which maps R to R, is not continuous. In particular, it's not continuous anywhere, not even on um, the rationals, not even on the irrationals. It's not continuous at either of them, right? But what we can do is we can restrict our set. So we can restrict it to Q, and we can also restrict it to R, not Q. And these are continuous. So this is continuous on its domain, and this also is continuous in its domain. So you can think about it this way. Well, if Dirichlet is restricted to the rationals, then this is practically equal to the function one. And if we restrict it to the irrationals, then this is practically the zero function, just like the restriction for Tom A directly above. So what exactly is causing the discontinuity? So when we restrict it, at least this, this is what the Bloom theorem sort of leads us to believe, is that the behavior at the points isn't what's causing the discontinuity, it's what's going on around the points that's actually causing the discontinuity, right? So for example, if I look at this particular curve here, which appears to be very, very smooth and continuous, so it appears to be continuous, but it's what's going on around the point that's actually making it very, very annoying, right? So for example, it's like, oh yeah, is this point continuous at the point? Obviously, yeah, but if obviously you have this type of thing there, you know, points around the point, um, then it's not continuous there, right? But according to Bloomberg, there always exists a dense subset such that it is continuous on that set, right? Now let's actually introduce another example that I didn't introduce, and this example is actually quite easy to deal with. Let's assume that f maps r to r, and let's define f of x to be equal to, let's just do cosine of x divided by x, um, where x is not equal to zero, and let's just define it to be zero at x is equal to zero. Okay. So obviously, um, you cannot plug in uh, zero for this function, at least for the top part, but f of zero is equal to zero in this definition. Right? But if you look at the graph of this little thing, and I don't remember what it looks like, I believe it looks something like this, um, this definitely is not continuous at zero because these pieces practically overlap because from the left it goes to infinity, from the right it goes to uh, negative infinity and at zero it's equal to zero and none of them match, right? So at least graphically and also from the definition, you can show that f um, does not belong to the set of continuous functions on the set of real numbers. So can you find a dense subset of R such that this function is continuous there? 
Well, obviously the only issue for this function is zero, and we already know that zero is a irrational. So one can clearly see that if we restrict this function f to the set of irrationals, keep in mind the irrationals is dense in R, um, this function will be a continuous function, right? So that's actually quite interesting. Now, finding a dense subset of a set is not always that trivial. Let me just give you the heads up on that. For example, if you have the closed interval 0 and 1 and you have a bunch of discontinuities on that interval, finding a dense subset of that interval 0, 1 is not that trivial because at least in this video, we've only been sort of working around the rationals and irrationals because those are obviously um, dense subsets of R. And also, you should be able to verify that the empty set is technically a dense subset of R as as well. Technically, I guess it sort of depends how you work around the vacuously true argument. But in either case, finding a dense subset um, is not always easy to find, but the Bloombird theorem does guarantee its existence, so you're always in luck, at least in the theoretical realm. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one as we continue to explore the concepts of continuity of real-valued functions. Take care.